I must say right from the beginning that uh, the, there is a deep interconnectedness between healing the dead and healing the living. It's more or less the same subject, but we will handle it the way it has been given to us. And also before I proceed, I think I need to add my voice, my voice, that those that are researching on Kukura wound must understand that they are researching on a genocide. And they must equip themselves with the skills of researching on a genocide, not a, a simple conflict. Those that are going to be handling Kukura Wundi, whether they are chiefs, whether they are NPRC, must have a similar understanding. That you are dealing with mass murder, mass killings, mass rape, mass everything. You are dealing with mass crimes, mass graves dotted all over uh, Matibele North, South, and the Midlands province. And if you do that, it helps you to, to approach this particular subject with the sensitivity it desires. Once you understand that, it becomes your good starting point. If you get that wrong and you deal with it as if it is another subject, then you are likely to get the results wrong also. And having said that again, I must stress that uh, the, this subject, this issue, the matter that I'm raising now of recognizing Kokura Wundi as a genocide is actually in a government document. The, the chief's document itself actually mentions Kokura Wundi as a genocide. If you have read it, you have read the English and the developed versions, you will understand what I'm talking about. So there is a wider acceptance even amongst the perpetrators, even amongst the government, officials that this, they are dealing with a, a wider problem. And that is the beginning of the solution. Right. To, to heal the living after a mass atrocity like Kukura Wonde, there are four key things that are required. And I'm going to talk about them from an international best practice standpoint of view not disregarding completely what is being done by who and what has been done by who, just from an international best practice standpoint of view, what has worked in other countries and what has not worked, so that we avoid repeating the mistakes that have delivered analogy in other countries and do what has worked in other countries because the crimes will be the same, people respond similarly uh, to mass atrocities. There are four pillars that are very crucial to dealing with a, a subject of mass murder like Kukura Wundi, and they will be extremely important in addressing and ensuring healing the living. And they are necessarily divided into the right to the truth, the right to reparations, the right to justice, and guarantees of non-recurrence of what would have taken place. So whatever process seeks to address a situation like we have, must at the end of the day pillar itself on those four crucial principles that are a basis of international research that have been found to work. That, that, those are the principles upon which when you are dealing with an abusive past, you base your interventions in. So the starting point on the right to the truth is that uh, it, the truth has a healing effect on those who would have been affected by a particular atrocity. But even before you get to the substantive matters around the truth, you need to deal with the truth as a process. The process of getting to the truth is as much important as the truth that you get out of that process. If the process is flawed, the truth would be insufficient. The truth will not contribute to the healing of the, of the living. So you need a process that is very credible. 
Baba Nare. A very credible. Baba Mshan. Very credible. A process that is independent of the perpetrators. And this is important. Because in our particular situation, the biggest challenge is that we have never, nowhere on earth has there been a post-conflict or a post-atrocity transitional justice or dealing with the past process when the perpetrator is still in charge of the levers of power. It has never happened. So we are attempting to deal with a new situation that we have never seen done anyway in the world. So we need to pay attention to that. That there is likely to be attempts to interfere in the processes by the perpetrators. So those that will be handling processes of this nature must guard against interference. Because when you deploy a process that is flawed, it has a tendency to re-traumatize it has a tendency to re-victimize the victims. I look at the process that is being deployed and as a victim, as a survivor, I, I say, is there anything that is going to come out of that? And once I have a problem with that, I will have a problem with the outcome. So it is important that the process be credible, the process be seen to be credible by those who suffered. It must not seek to save those who committed the crimes, but its the victims and the survivors. So once the process is like that, whether it is done, I'm not going to go into the details of whether the chief's process is okay, or the NPRC is okay, or that one versus the other. I'm just dealing with the international best practices. Independent truth-seeking processes are the foundation. And that is what heals. If you don't have an independent truth-seeking exercise, you will have a problem at the end of the day. And the process must hear from both the victims and the perpetrators. It must hear from both. I don't want to, to discuss whether or not the processes that are being proposed will hear from both. That is not my subject here. My subject is just to talk about international best practices. Get the truth, those multiple truths, those many versions of the truth must come out from the perpetrator, from the victim, the survivor as well. There are certain stories that will be incomplete until you have heard from the perpetrator. Let me give an example where there is a an enforced disappearance. I lost my father. I'm still looking for my father who disappeared, who was taken at night. And somebody comes to me, that is all I can talk about, that it was 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. But I don't know the circumstances under which he, he died. Or if he's dead at all. That can only be, that can only come from the perpetrator. He's the one who can then complete the truth. And that complete truth is the one that would contribute to my healing. So you need comprehensive, a comprehensive and, co and a complete search for the truth. Very, very important. And the, it, the process must be victim-centered and not perpetrator-driven, perpetrator-manipulated and perpetrator-led. It must be victim-centered. In other words, it must put the, the interest of the victim ahead of all other interests. And those victims or survivors will be varied in, them, in terms of their experiences and so forth. Then it brings the issue that I, I, in the passing, let me mention the gender dimension. Because women and men will, even in a similar situation, will experience the effect of the atrocities in a different way. So you need to take that into account so that you do not re-victimize the woman victim or survivor. So you need a process of that nature, a process that is very comprehensive, that is complete, that reaches out to every community. Get to every community. Don't leave out any, any community. Every community must be helped.
And the, the process must give people adequate time. They must not be hurried. In other words, you don't want to get to the people and say, oh, look, we, we are in a hurry here. We are rushing after time. So, Asilas card, we don't have time. So, be, uh, uh, I'm giving you 10 minutes, 10 minutes to, to, to tell your stories. In respect of the Kukura Mundi genocide, the challenge with that is that some people were violated as early as 1980 until 1988. They have a story to tell for every year. And they, they were subjected to different violations in different years. In one year, they were tortured. In another year, they were unlawfully detained. In another year, they were raped. In another way, they were otherwise sexually violated. So it becomes a, lem, a long story that they must be given adequate time to tell. And also, those that uh, want to tell their stories in private must be given that opportunity to do so. There must be a, 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 a witness protection program. No one must be victimized after their testimony. They must feel safe. The political environment must enable them, at least by the pronouncements of those in power, that you are free to tell your story, your experiences, you are not going to be in any way punished for what you, you would have said. So you need to be clear about that. That process is extremely important. And then once we get the truth, the comprehensive truth, on the basis of that truth, we then get to the next stages, the next legs. The first leg being the right to reparations. And the reparations must themselves be comprehensive, must be complete, must reach out to every possible victim and survivor. They must target individuals and they must target communities as well. Because there are certain violations that can only be dealt with at a, at a community level. My brother, Dr. Moyo, earlier uh, on spoke about the, the impact of Kokura Wundi beyond the violated individuals into the economic space, into the jobs market, into, into everything. As a, as a matter of fact, I want to remind people who are sitting here that uh, even the delimitation process in Matavele leading to the decision of whether you have so many, uh, 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 what do you call this, constituencies or not, is itself also inextricably linked to violations that happened during Kukura. Because as a result of Kukura, the people fled. They are in the diaspora, and as a result of Kukura, uh, 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 people are not registering as voters, and, and, so forth, and so forth. And therefore, at the end of the day, when Zex sits down and says, well, we are going to cut this constituency and this constituency, to some people, that is a perpetuation of the impact of Kokura Wood. So you need that awareness of the comprehensiveness of Kokura Wood. Do not limit it to 20,000 people dead, 20, 40,000 and so forth. It's wider socioeconomic, cultural impact and so forth. The fear. All you need now is to go down to communities and say, look, if you do this, we are going to repeat Kukura Wondi, and they understand the implications. So that is important. And then quickly, uh, the, the next one is the issue of justice. The justice comes in, in, in many ways, but it, it must be at least in the back of the minds of the people. Whether it is civil justice or what, or what kind of justice, you need at the end of the day to have a consideration for that, I'm talking about international best practices. And the last uh, of the legs before I sit down is guarantees of non recurrence Everything must be done to reform, not just the constitution, the legislation, but the state infrastructure as a whole, to guarantee that this kind of a setting will never repeat the kind of violations that took place in the past. And to do so, you require uh, an eye or and an ear of understanding what happened and how it happened. In this particular instance, it matters because, unlike in other countries where you are dealing with non-state actors, in this particular instance, the perpetrator, the chief perpetrator was the state. 
And if the state has not been reformed on the basis of what we know it did in Machimere and then the meter, then we are still having a dangerous state. If the infrastructure of Kukura will be still intact, then we have a problem, a possibility of a similar violations on a smaller or larger scale. So you want to go in and deal with those vigorously and say we are changing the state so that it is able, it is disabled. The infrastructure of violence must be disabled so that the opportunity for justice and peace is there. As far as honoring of believing is concerned, Mr. Mube said number one, we want to ask ourselves the question why. Why should the living be honored? What's the rationale for honoring them? And in that regard, he gave us issues of demassification of violence, demassification of crimes against humanity, demassification of impunity, and demassification of injustice. We need not belabor that issue. We know the stories, we have heard the stories. So the bottom line is we cannot move forward if we don't acknowledge that injustices were carried out, violations were perpetrated. That's the starting point for Mr. Gomez's presentation. And he says, as long as we do that process using the wrong lenses, we will not get anywhere. And in this regard, the wrong lenses will be putting the cut before the horse. Where we wanted to solve a problem before we acknowledge that there is a problem. A scenario where we wanted to go to the ground and say we will do A, B, C, D, we will bring development, we will exhume ETC. Why are we exhuming? What happened? Who did what? That's what Mr. what Mr. Nube is saying here. We have to acknowledge and accept the past if ever we are to find a solution to the problem confronting us. That's the why part. The second issue that I picked from Mr. Nube's presentation was the how part. Yes, we wanted to honor the living. How are we going to honor them? And he gave us four very clear issues. The most crucial, the most important, being truth-telling, truth-seeking. We cannot rush to say we want to honor the living if we don't accept that something wrong happened. And acceptance of what was wrong that happened starts with the wrong doer, accepting that they were wrong and they did something wrong. That's the first basic principle about the truth. Truth can never be attained without acknowledgement, from what Umuwe told us here. We need to have the perpetrator, or some may say maybe the way the perpetrator is too heavy, the offender, or maybe it's too heavy, the wrong tool, accepting that they are in the wrong. And they tell us why they did what they did. They tell us how they did what they did like he highlighted here. If we only talk to the victim we have the story, the victim will tell us, I was victimized, I was sexually abused, I was raped, I was tortured. But we don't know who did it. So the person who did is to come forward and say, I did A, B, C, D. For all those who disappeared, they are in place A, B, C, D. That's what Mr. Nguyen is saying here. And he points at one very crucial aspect confronting us as Zimbabweans. The fact that we are breaking new ground, if ever we are to achieve success in this process. We are breaking new ground in the sense that we wanted to achieve transitional justice without a transition. We wanted to achieve transitional justice when we have not shifted from the period of violations. In terms of years, we may have, not, we, we may have shifted. But in terms of practice, we have not shifted. So Unmube is saying, as long as we do not handle that process very well and very carefully, transitional justice may not be attained, may not be achieved, because we have not had a transition. We still have the wrong tool pulling the levers of power. So it becomes a problematic issue there. 
And in line with that, he says, if ever the process is to be successful, we need it to be credible. We need a thorough process that does not cut corners. That does not hide behind a finger. That does not sugarcoat what happened or what occurred. We should just go a spade, a spade, and never call it the young one of a shovel. That's what Utome is saying. He says if the truth is to be acceptable, it has to be a truth that is sensitive to the needs of the victim. A truth that allows the victim to pour out the pain, the trauma, the frustration. So that at the end of the day, that process of pouring out can actually help them in healing. Because without actually letting out the steam, the healing process may never okay. Because the steam will still be pouring out. That's what we may be trying to do if we try to cut corners in the truth telling process. Number two, he says that we need a process of reparation. And the reparations, he says, should either be individual or they should be community. We have got people who underwent individual pain, individual trauma, and they need to be reparated or compensated in a just manner. Some were maimed and they lost livelihoods. Something has to be done to bring that family back to its feet because of individual injustice. Then we've got injustice at a community level, where the whole community suffered indignity, suffered embarrassment, humility, etc., which is actually a common occurrence. And on this one, I think that it's not just about the community, it's about the whole region. The reparation that is never should be not just a community based, but the whole region needs reparations. Because there is no community that can actually say, we did not suffer the indignity of Kukurangu. So Unube is saying, we need to actually work out the formula. How do we focus on individual pain, on individual hating? And how do we focus on community pain and community hating? He highlights a very crucial and important issue. The issue of displacements. I know nowadays what is topical are development-induced displacements. We have got Gwai Shangani, we have got the Chinese in Wange, etc. But in this regard, we are looking at conflict-induced displacement, which he rightfully pointed out as implications of delimitation. We are told the material is the least population of all provinces in Zimbabwe. Why? Why? Because of the trauma. You have people who have got an identity in South Africa, but they don't have an identity in Zimbabwe. So they can't vote in Zimbabwe because they don't have an identity. Even if they were to come home, they can't register. Well, the South Africa wants to vote in EFF, vote in COPE, vote in ASIM, or will I identify in South Africa? All those are issues that come out of Kukurahundi. And all those are issues that need to be looked at if ever we are to find a solution. Why should Matebel and Perpetual have very few constituencies? Because we are told the population is very low. Unmobe says it goes back to Kukurahundi. We cannot solve Kukurahundi if we don't have adequate constraints in material that are commensurate with the people who should be here, who have been forcibly displaced. Number three, he talks about justice. And when looking at justice, basically he's looking at the issue of which route do we want to take? Do we want the prosecution or want amnesty? And that can only be arrived at through what? Through consultative processes. We don't want a top-down approach where someone in some lofty office somewhere decides that we are going to pronounce General Clemens Order number 99 of the year 2025 and say all Kukura only crimes are forgiven and we bury the hatchet. We say that by goals, by goals. Umume is saying we need a process where we decide and agree who do we want to prosecute if we want to prosecute and who do we want to grant an amnesty if we want an amnesty. Then last but not least, when looking at guarantees of non-recurrence, Unube highlights a very important issue. 
He says, as long as we still have the vampire state of the 1980s, we cannot hope to have a solution to the Bukurawati issue. We need institutional reform. We need security sector transformation. As long as we still have a scenario where we have got state institutions that serve at the behest of a political party, Bukurawati cannot be solved. I thank you.